Chances are you've heard of probiotics or wondered if you should give your infant probiotics. They're often the promised remedy for so many things in infants, including colic, constipation, or gassiness. The question is, is there actually evidence to back up these recommendations? Does your infant need them or should you save your money? This video will cover the research behind the use of probiotics in infants and when their use can be indicated. It'll cover common brands and what to look for when choosing a probiotic. I'm Dr. Mona, a pediatrician and mom. I help empower parents with easy to understand and evidence-based information so you can make the best choices for your child. Make sure to like this video and subscribe here to Peds Doc Talk TV to stay up to date on the latest videos and new content. Probiotics are good bacteria or microorganisms that live in our gut. We often associate bacteria with harm and sickness, but your body has a lot of bacteria that work to help your body. Probiotics work to keep your gut or intestines healthy and create a balance, preventing too much harmful bacteria from taking over. You may have heard of the terms microbiome or microflora, which refer to all the good organisms that live in our gut. In the first few years of life, the gut microbiome undergoes significant development and the balance of bacteria in the gut can be influenced by various factors, such as mode of delivery at birth, maternal or infant antibiotic use, and diet. Probiotics are in certain foods like yogurt, kefir, sourdough bread, some soft cheeses, and pickles. They are also available as a dietary supplement or are sometimes added to certain formulas or other foods. The reality is there's still a lot of ongoing research on the effects of probiotics and the microbiome, and I personally am very interested in this research. But today we'll discuss where the current evidence stands and how to use this information to make choices for your family. Let's start first with the idea of giving a probiotic to an infant born via C-section. Each method of delivery, whether by vaginal delivery or by cesarean section, produces a different level of exposure to good bacteria and therefore a different colonization pattern. For babies born via vaginal delivery, they ingest maternal microbiota or good bacteria as they pass through that birth canal. This exposure helps develop the infant's microbiome, which produces intestinal protection from infection and inflammation. Infants born via C-section typically have less diverse bacteria and fewer health promoting bacteria than those born via vaginal delivery because they are born in a more sterile environment, which is a surgical space, and didn't come through that vaginal canal. A study in Denmark did show that babies born via C-section were at increased risk for allergy and juvenile arthritis over the first five years of life compared to infants born via vaginal delivery. However, it's hard to know if this is solely because of the mode of delivery itself, because antibiotics are almost always administered during C-section deliveries to prevent infection, or it could be other factors. Antibiotics are known to disrupt the microbiome and kill good bacteria, so it's hard to know if the disruption is from antibiotic administration, the decreased exposure to bacteria during a C-section, or a mix of both. Regardless, studies do show that supplementing a breastfed infant born via C-section with multi-species probiotics does produce a similar level of beneficial bacteria as infants born via vaginal delivery and more to come about formula fed babies. Another study showed that supplementing babies born via C-section with probiotics of various strains decreased the risk of allergy development until age five. No reduced risk was noted in babies born via vaginal delivery. Beyond these studies, there's not a lot of strong research to support probiotic supplementation in babies born via C-section. Hence, there is no official organization like the AAP that has a recommendation on giving probiotics for all babies born via C-section. So deciding to start one for your infant should be a discussion between you and your child's clinician. From the studies we do have, there is a potential benefit of the use of probiotic supplementation in breastfed infants born via C-section 
or infants born via C-section who are at higher risk of developing allergies or eczema. But the quality of evidence is low and more studies are needed. As a C-section mama myself, I did give our son formula with probiotics given he was a C-section baby and this was a personal choice. For me, the sterility of a C-section and the fact that both myself and my son received antibiotics during delivery as well as after delivery, I weighed the benefit of this and started probiotics, which was Gerber Good Start with probiotics, not sponsored. Okay, so let's move on to colic. You've probably seen probiotics marketed for colic and boy, oh boy, do they sell because parents do not like colic. Probiotics are a multi-billion dollar industry and it makes sense when we as parents are willing to just try anything to get our baby to stop crying and sleep well. Now the data supporting the use of probiotics in colic is conflicting. A systematic review in 2017 showed that infants receiving a probiotic containing l ruteri had a 2.3 fold greater chance of having at least a 50% decrease in crying or fussiness compared to a control group. The problem with the study was that it didn't control for other factors, like psychosocial factors, if the babies were consuming a formula that had probiotics added to it, or if the mothers of breastfeeding babies had cut out things like dairy from their diet. Both of these factors can make the study harder to interpret. Still with this potential for symptom improvement, many parents feel it's at least worth trying to see if it helps ease their baby's symptoms. I do have a video coming about colic on this channel. I personally do not mind probiotics for colic and feel compared to other things like semethicone or bright water, taking a probiotic with l ruteri is again a benefit-risk conversation. Benefit being, could it potentially aid in colic? Maybe. Risk being the supplement industry is not regulated, so we are trusting companies for safety. In a small study of 21 babies, l ruteri was deemed safe but this is an extremely small sample size. So if you would like to give your infant a probiotic for colic, speak to your child's clinician to confirm and weigh benefit and risk. Make sure to also watch until the end of this video for various brands of infant probiotics on the market. What about probiotic use in preterm babies or babies born at less than 37 weeks gestation? There is actually high quality evidence that supplementing preterm low birth weight infants with specific probiotics can reduce the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and decrease the duration of hospitalization for infants in the NICU. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a life-threatening illness that occurs most frequently in very preterm infants, which results in inflammation of the intestine, causing cell death and tissue destruction in the colon and intestines. There is strong evidence that probiotic supplementation, specifically with L. rhamnosus, B. bifidus, and B. infantis, decreases the risk of neck. But it should be noted that these studies looked at multi-strain probiotics regimens given in the NICU, making it hard to determine which particular probiotic strain is most useful. We do not, however, currently have studies showing safety and efficacy in preterm infants outside of the hospital who have not experienced neck or we're at risk for neck. When it comes to my preterm babies, I also take a risk and benefit approach in discussing whether we should do over-the-counter probiotic supplementation. And I ask that you do the same with your baby's clinician. Constipation is another reason many parents will start a probiotic. One important differentiation I want to make is the difference between constipation and what we call infant dyskesia. Constipation is the passage of infrequent, firm, hard stools. Dyskesia, on the other hand, is very common in infants under six months of age and is a functional condition where infants strain and sometimes cry for up to 10 to 20 minutes before passing a soft stool. This happens because infants have not yet figured out how to relax their pelvic floor and abdominal muscles while simultaneously increasing their abdominal pressure to be able to poop. It's a lot of work. This combo is needed to result in a successful bowel movement. With dyskesia, infants haven't yet mastered this combo and strain and turn red and cry prior to passing a bowel movement, but the bowel movement is soft and occurs regularly. This is not constipation. Dyskesia typically spontaneously resolves after a few weeks and no treatment 
is necessary. But back to true constipation. Can probiotics really help? A study completed in 2010 showed that infants with constipation supplemented with L-ruteride had more frequent bowel movements compared to infants given a placebo, but there was no significant difference in stool consistency, like hardness or in inconsolable crying episodes. Therefore, a probiotic is not typically recommended as first-line therapy to treat constipation. Some pediatricians will recommend a change in diet, like switching formulas if they're formula-fed, offering small sips of water in infants over six months of age, or they may recommend certain medications. Talk with your child's clinician about what may be the best treatment if your child is constipated. So you may be wondering if your infant is formula fed, how important is it to give them a formula that has a probiotic or adding a probiotic in? Probiotics being added to formulas is a relatively new phenomenon, first coming to market in the United States in 2007. It's important to note that all formulas on the US market must meet strict federal nutrition requirements. All formulas require a minimum amount of 29 nutrients and a maximum amount for nine of those nutrients. Because of this, most healthy infants would grow and thrive on any of the standard formulas on the market. There is no strong evidence that a formula with probiotics added to it is superior to other formulas overall. And probiotics are typically a marketing tool to try to set a formula apart from competitors. However, the one instance where it may be worth talking with your child's clinician about switching formulas is in the case of colic or excessive gas, like I mentioned before. As mentioned, some studies have shown L-ruteri helps in colicky infants compared to placebo or gas drops, and certain formulas have L-ruteri added, like Gerber Gentle and Gerber Soothe. However, not all babies will see symptom improvement with switching, and there can be an associated higher cost with these formulas. So discuss with your child's clinician if it's worth trying based on your child. I don't ever recommend switching formulas if your baby is doing well on it. So just say you had a baby via C-section who is thriving, so they're growing well without colic or excessive gas on a formula without probiotics. I would not recommend starting one as it's clinically not needed for your child, or if you're breastfeeding, to switch to a formula with probiotics. Of note, over-the-counter probiotics are not regulated in the United States for safety and efficacy. However, when probiotics are in formula in the United States, they are regulated for safety and efficacy because they are in formula. So as I mentioned, probiotics are not all the same. Certain probiotics have been proven to be effective for certain things. The most common probiotic supplements we see used in children are cultural probiotic drops, BioGaia Protectus, Avivo Infantis, and Gerber Soothe Colic Drops. Both BioGaia and Gerber Soothe are given as drops and they contain L-ruteri, which evidence shows can potentially reduce colic symptoms. Avivo is a newer probiotic and is administered as a powder that's mixed with formula or breast milk and contains B. infantis. This is the probiotic that is shown to reduce risk of neck in preterm infants. Finally, Culturel probiotics contain L. rhamnosus as well as Bifidobacterium lactis, which are highly studied probiotics as well. Evidence has supported their use to reduce symptoms of infectious diarrhea, but I will do another episode about probiotics in older children later. Culturel, BioGaia, and Gerber Soothe all offer drops that have vitamin D added to them as well, which may be convenient for breastfed babies requiring vitamin D supplementation. It's important to note that many of the studies previously mentioned included multi-species probiotics compared to these marketed probiotic supplements that typically contain only one or two probiotic species. All probiotics are not the same, and more studies are needed to determine the effectiveness of single species supplementation on specific conditions. More research is also needed to determine the optimal types, doses needed, and duration of probiotic supplementation. So far, it appears that effects from probiotics are only noted when they are actively being taken. And once use is discontinued, the gut bacteria resorts back to its original species breakdown. So continuing the probiotics until solids have been established can be of benefit as when an infant is actively eating solids and maybe probiotic rich foods like 
yogurt with probiotics, their gut microbiome can also change for the better with new bacteria. Like I mentioned, it's also important to weigh possible benefits and risks. Probiotics are generally considered safe for healthy infants, but there have been rare cases where probiotics have been contaminated and resulted in harm, particularly in very low birth weight infants or immunocompromised infants. And probiotics aren't regulated by the US Food and Drug Administration. They can rarely be contaminated, it happens, and sometimes don't contain the exact probiotic amounts as advertised. Therefore, parents and clinicians should weigh the individual risks and benefits for each infant. As long as the dose is taken appropriately, side effects are rare, but possible side effects may include gassiness, bloating, abdominal discomfort, vomiting, or diarrhea. And of course, if side effects are noted, the supplement should be discontinued. There is some negativity surrounding supplementation of probiotics in the health space, with some pediatricians saying no baby needs them. But I don't poo-poo it, no pun intended, altogether. I do think they can serve some benefits in the situations I've already mentioned. I don't, however, think that every infant needs it, nor are there blanket recommendations that one, all formula fed babies should have it, two, all C-section babies should have it, or three, all babies who received antibiotics at birth should have it, or four, all colicky babies should have them. The hard reality is there is no definitive yes or no in switching to a probiotic formula, if your child is formula feeding, or adding a probiotic supplement. So I hope a healthy discussion can be had with your child's clinician. I do hope this video helps you in having these discussions because in situations like colic or like me, if your baby was delivered via C-section, you received a load of antibiotics, you may consider the benefits and risks of starting a probiotic. So there you have it. Can a probiotic help certain symptoms, possibly for colic and to prevent complications in preterm infants? Are they safe to take? For most healthy infants, yes, as long as used as directed, the risk of complication or side effects is rare. Should you try it for your baby? It's up to you and your clinician. They can also be quite costly, so I'd recommend talking to your clinician about your specific concerns to make sure a probiotic is appropriate for a child. And if so, which one is best? Please leave questions and comments below. If you found this information helpful, please like and share this video and make sure to subscribe here to Pete's Doc Talk TV to be the first to know about new videos published. I'll see you all next time for another video here on Pete's Doc Talk TV. Stay well.